All right, and welcome back. Um, so last time we talked about the Great Depression, and we ended with the presidential election in which FDR, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is elected as president. So what we're going to look at now is what FDR does to try to help get the country back on its feet and to get the economy moving again. Because remember, what really caused the Great Depression is not just the, the um, stock market crash, but it's the fact that people were hoarding onto their money and holding onto it and that no money was actually in circulation. Now, what FDR is going to do is he's going to implement a program called the New Deal. Um, so the New Deal is his program to try to help provide relief, recovery, and reform. So when you think of the New Deal, it had three main goals, the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Now, um, the thing about it is, is a lot of the programs that FDR is going to implement with the New Deal actually were things that Hoover was doing, but the issue was is that Hoover was only doing them at a local level. He wanted states and he wanted smaller um, localized governments to take action, whereas FDR said no, we need the federal government to do things to help put people um, back to work and to help get the economy going again. So some of the ideas FDR gets, he does get from Hoover's programs, it's just FDR is willing to take a more powerful approach by trying to use the federal government and the national government to issue the reforms and not localized government. Now, the New Deal is split into two different um, New Deals. You have the first New Deal, which really exists between 1933 and 1934. Um, and a lot of this is really, this is kind of um, what you would consider FDR's honeymoon period, if you will, of him getting into office and, and trying to fix things. Now, FDR, he's elected in November of 1932. Under the Constitution, he does not take office until March 4th of 1933. Um, and this issue of the lag between FDR being elected to him not taking office until March of the following year is going to result in a change in the Constitution. Amendments are going to be passed to change to say that the president has to be um, inaugurated in January. So this is why our current administrations and our current presidents are um, inaugurated in January, unlike the March, like the Constitution actually set. Now, one of the first things FDR is going to do is during his um, inaugural address, his first inaugural address, um, he wanted to rebuild the, the nation's confidence. So this address is broadcast nationwide, several radio networks all across the United States uh, air it, and the speech was heard by tens of millions of Americans. Um, the address was 20 minutes long, and it's best known for the first line, or one of the first lines. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Um, what FDR's main message to Americans was is he did not want people to be afraid anymore. He wanted them to work together and try to fix the problem, not be paralyzed by their fear. Um, he openly admitted he didn't know all the answers, but he said, this nation asks for action and action now. He said, because you're asking for that, I'm going to give it to you. Um, he also asked Congress for a broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency. Um, and he said, you know, we need to treat this like we're just at war with an actual enemy. Now, during FDR's first hundred days, um, he has several things he wants to try to focus on. The first, he wants to revive the industrial economy. The second, he wants to relieve the widespread human misery. Third, he wants to rescue the ravaged farm sector. Uh, sector and desperate families. You know, farmers have always struggled pretty much throughout American history, but especially during the Depression, as loans are being called in, they're going to be struggling um, just as they always have. And he also wanted to reform the capitalist system that he thought helped cause the Depression. Now, this last point is really important because it's important to know that even though FDR is going to fundamentally change the size of the federal government and the powers of the federal government, he never intended to undo the capitalist system. 
Instead, all of his changes, all of his expansion of government power was all driven to try to support the capitalist system, to try to support capitalism. Um, so these, these things are some of the things he wants to accomplish and try to do within his first hundred days in office. Now, while he's doing that, he's going to um, assemble what he calls a brain trust, which was basically um, a large group of a lot of really brilliant specialists. Many of them were college professors um, to try to come up with their strategy to try to fix, fix the problems of the Depression. So his strategy to try to accomplish um, his goals of the first 100 days was the first thing he wanted to immediately address the money crisis. He wanted to provide short-term emergency relief to the jobless. So he wants to try to say, okay, we have a problem with money. Let's try to fix it. Uh, so one of the first things he's going to do is he's going to try to fix the banking industry. Um, the second thing is he wanted to encourage agreements between upper management and unions, labor unions. He wanted workers to have some protections. Um, and the third thing is he wanted to raise the depressed commodity prices by paying farmers subsidies. So essentially what he wants to do is he wants farmers to shrink their supply. He wants them to shrink the amount of crops they're growing so he can hopefully um, increase their, their earning potential there. Um, so pretty much the first 100 days for FDR is really considered between March 9th through June 16th. Um, and during that period, FDR and Congress together are going to pass a total of 15 legislative measures. Now, we're not going to look at all 15 of these, but we are going to look at some of the most important that come out of this period um, to try to help jumpstart the economy and help get people back to work. Now, remember, for the first New Deal, the goal of the first New Deal is to provide a sense of economic relief. So the first, the first things they want to do is they want to help transition the country to more active government um, and a belief in, in economic justice. Um, and so one of the first things that FDR is going to do with Congress is he wants to build American trust in the banks again. So because he wants to build and get people to support the banks again, he is going to get Congress to pass something called the Emergency Banking Act. Now, this act passed in 1933, and it's one of the first things that FDR is going to do. And it is designed to get the country back on its feet again. Um, the legislation was actually written by the Treasury staff during Hoover's administration. Um, and what it does is it allowed failing banks to basically catch their breath and to be appropriated uh, money to stabilize the banks to keep the financial system from com completely collapsing. So what it, what it did is it expanded the president's power over banks and allowed FDR to declare what's called a bank holiday. Essentially, he closed the, all the banks for about four days. Um, and this was to prevent people from trying to take their money out. And um, the purpose of it is to allow banks to kind of catch their breath. Um, and to prop up failing banks. So the government would literally put money back into banks to help them keep going again. Um, now the first banks that are going to reopen, of course, are going to be the Federal Reserve. So even under this Emergency Banking Act, the Fed, the 12 big banks from the Federal Reserve are going to be shut down. Um, but those are going to be the first ones that they're going to focus on. Now in a fireside chat as early as March 12, 1933, FDR is going to go on the radio and he's going to tell Ameri the American people that I can assure you that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than under the mattress. Um, the following day on March 13th, deposits finally exceeded withdrawals for the first time since the stock market crash. So this was a really big, a big thing. Some people really still started to trust the banks. Others were still very skeptical. Now, the next thing that FDR is going to do is he's going to get Congress to pass something called the Glass-Steagall the Glass Act. Um, and what this does is it prevented conventional banks from investing savings of depositors into the stock market. Um, so what this does is this called for a separation between investment banking and commercial banking. It said banks could no longer put um, the money that their customers were putting into the bank into the stock market. Um, it also gave the Federal Reserve more authority to intervene during financial emergencies. Now, another thing that is done 
and is closely related to this and is still in effect today and is created by the glass de Gaulle Act is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or the FDIC. And what this did is it guaranteed bank deposits up to $250,000. So it's designed to reduce the likelihood of another panic or the run on the bank. What people realized is the problem that really triggered the depression is that banks had overlent money. Um, and they overlent money by when the second someone would deposit money in the bank, that money would then go out to a loan or go into the stock market for somebody else. And so what this does is this says that if you put money in the bank, the bank is going to guarantee that a certain amount is there. Now, of course, when we look in the 21st century, this dollar amount that uh, is guaranteed to be in the bank has been increased. But right now, uh, and it, this is a really positive thing in the 1930s to encourage Americans to put their money in the bank, um, to let them know that it was safe. Um, so this whole legislation is designed to prevent another run on the bank. Um, so it's designed to help rebuild people's confidence. Now, another um, act that Congress is going to pass is called the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA. Um, what the NRA did is it worked with businesses to establish industry codes. It set up standards of output, prices, and working conditions. It's so modeled um, after the War Industries Board of World War I, and it established a set 40-hour work week. It also set minimum weekly wages at $13 um, a week. And it put a ban on child employment for kids under the age of 16. Um, now, when I say it established industry codes and a set of standards, what it also did is it basically helps it. it if you joined this, um, this thing, they could also kind of put um, restrictions and things on what, how much you're producing, at what price you're producing it, and things like that. Um, it emphasizes worker rights. Now, as you can see, this little picture right here, businesses who were members of the NRA, um, they had this little sticker that had this blue eagle on it. Um, some people started boycotting businesses that did not have the blue eagle. Um, and so really, for a lot of people, the NRA was seen as something they really wanted to see businesses join. But the Supreme Court is going to take a look at the NRA. And in May of 1935, they're going to rule it unconstitutional because they said it infringed upon the separation of powers under the Constitution. Um, so it's not going to be around all that long. Now, another um, act that Congress is going to do is the measure they're going to take is they're going to establish what's this called the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and what this does is it's a federal agency that establishes um, uh, trading stocks, basically. Um, what this does is it provided more government oversight for the stock market. Um, it also required anybody who worked as a stockbroker to actually be licensed and to have a license to say they are, are licensed and have passed certain qualifications um, to be able to work in the stock market industry. Um, so this is to try to get people's faith back up in the stock market. You know, the other things were to get people's faith in business and in the banks. This is designed for the stock market. Now, these next few things are designed to try to get people back to work. Because remember, one of the other big problems here in the Depression is that unemployment is massive. It reaches a high as close to 33%. Um, so unemployment is, is a big problem. So they try to get people back to work. Now, one of the measures to get people back to work that Congress passes is called the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA. Um, and what this is, is this is actually legislation that paid farmers to produce less. It paid them not to farm. Um, so what this does, it starts to raise prices for crops and herds by paying farmers um, to cut back. Um, so it pays them not to farm. Um, the money from these payments then uh, were designed to help help farmers. Um, just to give you an idea of how successful this was, um, because of this, 6 million baby pigs were slaughtered to keep pork prices up, to keep it so farmers can make a profit from it. Um, farm income uh, increased 
by about 58% um, from 1932 until 1935, so it does help farmers. But the Supreme Court is going to declare it unconstitutional again because of the separation of powers um, of the federal government. We're going to talk about um, the challenges to the New Deal in a, a, a bit later when we talk about the second New Deal. But so far, just keep in mind, we've now had two pieces of legislation that the Supreme Court is going to rule as unconstitutional. Now, another means by which the federal government got people to get back to work is by the establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. Um, this is one of the most successful New Deal programs to provide jobs to the unemployed. Um, what the CCC did is they built um, all kind of roads, campgrounds, fire towers, fisheries, um, and all kind of parks, um, recreational areas, and soil conservation projects. Um, they recruited about 150,000 unemployed military veterans, um, also included about 85,000 Native Americans in this project. Um, they planted 3 billion trees, they taught farmers how to control soil erosion, they fought fires. Um, and what this is designed to do is this was only pretty much, if you look at this picture, you can kind of see, this program was designed for um, young unmarried men between the ages of about 18 to 25. Um, so it employed roughly 3 million million people. Um, young people between the ages of 18 and 35, all male. Workers received a $30 a month, but $25 of that had to be sent back home to their families while they were working. So they pretty much would make a profit about $5 a month with the rest of it going to their family um, to help them get back on their feet. Um, they also provided the opportunity for these men to earn their high school diploma while they're working. Now, Another program that Congress is going to establish is going to have a big impact on the South, and that's the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority, or the TVA. Um, and it was designed to bring electrical power and flood control um, to Appalachian Mountains and the areas in, in the South. This was a very, very ambitious venture. Um, it's one of the most innovative programs of the First New Deal. Um, and what it does is they hired workers to build a series of dams along the Tennessee River. And because what it did is it used that water power to help establish electricity. So it provided cheap electricity for the seven states along the river. Um, it provided 1.5 million farms with access to electricity and indoor plumbing for the very first time. Now the other thing is, is this also marks the very first time that the federal government actually enters into some type of competition with the private sector. Um, and so this shows you see, you know, some, some big support for uh, people of trying to help them get back on their feet because of the problems of the Depression. Now, with the First New Deal, not everybody is satisfied with it. There are a lot of people who are going to be dissatisfied with it. And most of the time, if you think of critics of the New Deal, you think of critics saying it's, it's over-expanding the government um, and FDR was becoming a dictator and he's not actually acting as a president. But you also have a lot of attacks from the left, from progressives, who argued that FDR was actually not doing enough. Now, one of the most famous examples of people arguing that FDR was not doing enough is a man named Huey Long. Um, Huey Long argued that FDR wasn't doing enough to get uh, people back on their feet. He said FDR could do more. Um, Huey Long was the governor of, of Louisiana. Um, he's also was a previous United States Senator from Louisiana. He's known, his nickname is the Kingfish. Very, very charismatic individual, as you can see from his dress. He wore two-toned shoes, white suits, and straw hats. Um, he was just a master of lecturing and telling funny stories. Um, now, the thing with Huey Long is he established something he, he, that was called the Share the Wealth Society. It's his really ambitious program. Um, and people saw Huey Long as a p potential candidate for president, and they saw him as, as someone who could rival and challenge FDR. Now, what the Share the Wealth Society did is it planned to raise taxes on the very wealthiest Americans, and to try to redistribute money to the people. 
Um, he supported giving every poor family $5,000. He wanted every worker to have an annual income of at least $2,500. He also reduced working hours. He wanted to provide pensions for retirees. And he wanted to put a cap on income. Um, he said that a person could only make $1.5 million a year. Now, in addition to all these things, he also wanted the federal government to give everyone a TV and a car. Um, now, uh, unfortunately for Huey Long, he is never going to actually be able to challenge FDR actually politically because he is going to be assassinated. So after his assassination, a lot of his share the wealth society ideas kind of fade away. Um, and of course, the other opposition to to FDR's New Deal comes from the Supreme Court. Um, by the mid-1930s, businesses were filing lawsuits left and right, saying that, that uh, the New Deal um, was kind of overstepping things of the government and trying to tell people what, what they could do. Um, so we talked about the NRA, which was ruled unconstitutional because of price fixing, and um, also as well as the AAA, or the Agricultural Adjustment Act. All right, well, tune in next time, and we'll talk about the second New Deal.